tonight's candidates for the Anambra governorship election sign peace pact ahead of Saturday's exercise as National Peace Committee asks voters not to be afraid to exercise their franchise. Political parties and last minute push for votes and final day of campaign for the Anambra governorship election. Lagos State Government puts death toll from collapsed Ikoi building at 32 as Governor Boretide Saolu declares three days of mourning. A U.S. Special Envoy arrives Ethiopia as Tigrayan forces approach capital Addis Ababa. Plus international news from our studio in London. On business news tonight, Deposit Money Banks issue 31st of December deadline for acceptance of old £20 and £50 notes in Nigeria. On sports news tonight, FIFA picks North African referees to officiate Super Eagles' last two games in the group phase of the 2022 FIFA World Cup qualifiers against Liberia and Cape Verde. And from Abuja, National Assembly questions rationale for standard gauge Kano Maradi rail line project as against what it describes as archaic lines in southeast and north central. We we'll begin with politics and Anambra State, where the candidates taking part in Saturday's governorship election have committed to a peaceful process before, during and after the poll. At a ceremony organized by the National Peace Committee in Orca, the state capital, the candidates and their party chairman, the INEC chairman and a representative of the Peace Committee all signed the agreement for a peaceful exercise. Our political correspondent, Shingo Kibaloye, reports. Is the consent of all. It is the final day of campaign ahead of the Saturday governorship election in Anambra State, and you can feel the anxiety. Violent incidents of the past weeks as what has brought everyone back into this room. There is a need to sign a peace accord. We are all gathered here in Anambra State. It is an initiative of the National Peace Committee, chaired by a former head of state, General Abdul Salam Abubakar, and convened the by the Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese, Bishop Matthew much. Kuka. And, and the agenda much. here is simple. The members of the National Peace Committee have come to a number of states to support a peaceful electoral process. We cherish a number of states and we cherish the peace and unity of Nigeria. Time we'll call you one after the other to give you that uh, special recognition. The politicians may be thinking of how to win the Saturday's election, but the fear of violence grips everyone, and the police is warning perpetrators of violence. But one thing I can assure you is that the police force, the army, and all of other security agencies posted in Anambra State will remain calm. We remain firm and we remain professional. INEC is assuring the voters of its readiness to conduct a credible polls, but security is what the umpire is also bothered about. I would like to appeal to all parties, candidates and other actors to play their roles in support of the peace accord. Without peace, our deployment plans New innovations in voter register accreditation and result management, safety of election duty personnel, security of materials, safety of all accredited observers, and ultimately the credibility of the polls will be undermined. The conviviality and pleasantry exchanges here is relieving. A momentary cessation of political hostilities, which could help douse attention in the state ahead of the election, highlighting the need for a great deal of sportsmanship. All right, thank you very much. Shoa Kimaloe, reporting for Channels Television thank News. Thank you very much. And staying with the Anambra poll, it's the final day of campaigns and the political parties are making a last-ditch effort to woo voters. Governor Willie Obiano used the occasion of the 2021 Civil Service Day to present the APGA governorship candidate, Professor Charles Saludo, to civil servants at the Jerome Udoji State Secretariat in Oka. He gave assurances that Professor Saludo would treat them even better if voted into office. 
The excitement is evident as the workers welcome Governor Willie Obiano, whom they fondly call the alert governor because of his prompt payment of salaries on the 25th of every month. This, the workers say, endears them to the governor with whom they have a good relationship. Since the creation of Anambra State on August 27, 1991, no governor, no governor has ever paid the pensions and gratuities of Anambra, workers of Anambra Nusabas. After receiving the presentation from the state printing press, an august visitor and Nollywood actor Chiwa Talu Agu joins in and appeals to the workers not to miss out on a saludo led government. If I didn't tell you, you must know that the name of the next person to take over for Manambra will start with S. Soludo. There's nothing like a peaceful atmosphere. For the head of service in Anambra State, a lot is at stake for the state's economy and asks the workers to vote to ensure continuity. He's been a father to the workers. He's been very kind-hearted, uh, very unparalleled in his uh, relationship with workers since he came in. Professor Charles Soludo, who considers himself a civil servant too, echoes this as he addresses the workers. But I can on the foundation already laid by our early working governor to consolidate, continue, and continue the transformation process. Governor Willie Obiano appreciates the workers for their support of his government and asks them to extend same to the ABGA candidate who will ensure their welfare is not tampered with. I have come with my successor, Professor Charles Soludo. He will do better than I have done in everything and so you don't have any problem. The visit to the workers comes days to the governorship elections in Anambra State and the ABGA campaign team hopes it has captured as many voters' hearts as possible as D-Day beckons. In the APC camp, Senator Andy Uba's governorship bid has received the support of Honorable John Bosco Onunkwo, the aspirant who came second during the party's governorship primary. He led hundreds of his supporters across the 21 council areas to join the Andy Uba campaign team. Seated here are members of Ife Diche campaign group of John Bosco Nunquo, the governorship aspirant who came second during the APC primary elections. Addressing the group, the deputy governorship candidate who represented Senator Andy Uba describes the group as a formidable one, saying their move to collapse their structure for Andy Uba is commendable and will boost his governorship bid. It's part of um, mending fences, reconciliation in the party. You can see that uh, High Chief John Bosco Anunqua is one of the founders of APC. He's one of the great sponsors or the financial sponsors of the party. And there's no way we can go into an election without bringing him on board. And that's why we're here today. Chairman of the All Progressives Congress in Anambra State, Basil HDK, expressed his confidence that the party will secure the seat. My message to the Anambrarians is to continue to be steadfast, to continue to remain with the party. Because, of course, from what you have seen, that we, the level of defection, I mean, has never been witnessed before in the political history of Anambra State. During an earlier visit to a Demili North local government area, Senator Andy Uba's campaign team donated mini buses to ward chairman that recently defected from Abga to the APC. Because they have uh, deferred all those offers by the government, and came into APC. His Excellency, the incoming Governor of Anambra State, Senator Dr. Andy Namdioba, decided also to extend that good way. We cannot wait for, gov for election to be over or for Senator Andy Oba to come in as a governor before offering them these shuttle buses. We decided to do that now. The APC believes it's well on track to take over the governorship seat in the next couple of days. 
And ahead of Saturday's election, the Inspector General of Police, Usman Al-Kali Baba, has ordered the restriction of vehicular movement in Anambra State. In the same issue today, the police boss explained that the restriction is part of measures aimed at protecting the sanctity of the electoral process on November the 6th. According to the order, there will be no movement of vehicles in and out of Anambra State from 11.59 p.m. on Friday, November the 5th, to 11.59 p.m. on Saturday, the 6th of November. He added that the restriction became necessary following security threats assessments conducted by the police and urged motorists and travellers to use alternative routes outside the state while the restriction lasts. Meanwhile, INEG has begun distribution of sensitive election materials from the central bank in Orca to various locations across the state. Meanwhile, governors of the southeast states say they are committed to a peaceful and successful governorship election in Anambra State. In a statement signed by the chairman, Southeast Governors Forum, and Governor of Ebony State, Governor David Mahi, the governors notes that they are aware of the various illegal orders of sit at home by different groups of agitators for Mondays and from November the 5th to 10th, 2021. The governors say they are in talks with some of the spokespersons of these groups and are urging them to stop all forms of violence and allow leaders to address the issues. In their words, we are, however, working with security agencies, our local security and our leaders to protect the lives of our people and to address all issues raised. In addition, they note that they have initiated a meeting with the federal government on these matters, including deploying political solutions in the case of Namdikanu. And our political correspondent, Sharon Kimbaloye, is in Orca and he joins us now. Hello, Sharon. It's last minute preparations in Anambra. Tell us about the atmosphere. Thank you, Millicent. The atmosphere in Orca, where we are at right now, is some kind of quiet. The quietness is not uh, of violence uh, or any other thing, it's just about the campaign. We've seen some quiet from politicians because this is a moment where they need to wait and see what the voters will do for them or against them because there are 18 of them that will be on the ballot. But now, according to what Section 101 of the Electoral Act says, that all broadcasts, all campaigns, jingles, political jingles are related to the election we now have to seize for the election. And so what we will be saying from tomorrow is the last minute preparations by INEC and the security operators in terms of their deployment. So eyes will be on the RAC centers, the LGAs, the ward, where we will be seeing some deployment of ad hoc officials, INEC officials, and of course the materials that will be used. Um, earlier today, this evening, you could feel the people are very, very cautious, and the manner in which you see the city of Orca quietly and gradually people getting back into their homes. There's that, you could feel it in the air, the anxiety and the anticipation for Saturday. Uh, one thing that is very critical about this election, which a lot of people will be looking forward to, politicians, electoral uh, development experts, INEC is how the bimodal accreditation system will work. This is perhaps going to be the first major election that INEC will put this to use. The bimodal accreditation is the advanced uh, version of what all of us knew in the 2015-2019 election where INEC deployed the use of uh, the smart card uh, reader machines. But this time around, it's going to be the my model where it can also read your biometrics and have the data of the voters in the different polling units. Also, uh, the uh, additional uh, polling units INEC added will also come alive. Not all of them that will be used, but those ones that will be used. This is the first time uh, that also will be put to test. A lot of things uh, will be put to test in this election, and that's why it's perhaps very critical, Millicent. So all eyes on Anambra. Many thanks, Cho, for that update. Our political correspondent, Cho and Kibaloi, keeping an eye of the, on the forthcoming elections in Anambra State. In part two, after the break, Works Minister Babatunde Fashola decries neglect of building standards in the country.
Please join us again. Welcome back. If you're just joined us, you're watching the News at 10 live on Channels Television Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Candidates for the Anambra governorship election signed peace back to head of Saturday's exercise as National Peace Committee asked voters not to be afraid to exercise their franchise. Political parties and last-minute push for votes in final day of campaign for the Anambra governorship election. Lagos State Government puts death toll from collapsed Ikari building at 32 as Governor Bawajide Sohonlu declares three days of mourning. And U.S. Special Envoy arrives in Ethiopia as Tigrayan forces approach capital Addis Ababa. And as rescue operations continue at the site of the collapsed 21-storey building on Gerard Road, Ikoi, the Lagos State Government has put the total number of bodies recovered from the site at 32. The body of the MD of four score, the developers of the building, Femi Oshibono, is set to be one of the bodies recovered today. Earlier, the National Emergency Management Agency had put the casualty figure at 38. Before his visit to the site today, Governor Songonlu inaugurated a six-man panel to investigate all issues surrounding the building collapse and declared three days of mourning over the disaster. <laughs> Onlookers around the site of the collapsed 21-story building have disappeared, but efforts are still ongoing to retrieve trapped people from the rubble. At a time such as this, ascertaining the casualty figure is always a challenge, especially with several government agencies involved in the rescue efforts. <laughs> To address that matter, the governor of Lagos State, who happens to be the incident commander, during his visit to the site of the disaster on the first day, gives an update on the casualty figure. As I speak here now, it's only 19, 19 names have been, have been provided. 19 names, some of them have pictures, some do not have pictures. But the total number of persons that people have come here to indicate that they're looking for someone um, or they're, they're, they're looking for a loved one, or a worker, or a brother, a sister. We have 19 names that have been that have been put forward here. So that will begin to help us to begin to design what are the possibility of a manifest, you know, coming out um, from from the from the um, from the response that we're having um, here today. As we stand here and we speak, they have recovered a total of 32 bodies. I repeat, 32 bodies have been so far recovered from this location and they've been transported to the bog. Uh, pursuant to the powers uh, conferred of, on Mr. Governor by the Tribunal of Inquiry Law, Laws of Lagos State 2015. Earlier in the uh, day, governor the governor, morning, in keeping with his promise, inaugurated a six-man independent panel to investigate all issues surrounding the building collapse. The government of Lagos State wants to unravel and get to the root cause of what had happened so that indeed we all can learn and truly learn from this very, very, very unfortunate incident and we all can be a part of history and ensure that we can live in a safe and secure environment. Members of this tribunal have been well, well chosen and that's why you could see that it could appear as a very simple event, but it's an important one. Indeed, all eyes will be on this panel as it begins the inquest into the possible causes of the collapse of this structure. Meanwhile, the Minister of Works and Housing, Babatunde Fashola, condemned the flagrant disregard for building standards and practice in the country. Mr. Fashola, who was reacting to the building collapse in Ikui, says until those found culpable are prosecuted, the trend might continue unabated. I was very involved with my team in enacting, enacting the fiscal and other planning law. One of the things we sought to do was to separate planning permit issuance from building control. So when you talk about LABCA today, uh, the building control agency, that was one of the things that we sought to do. We also made very stringent regulations 
that the buildings collapse under construction, uh, we we would have the power as government, subject to due process, to forfeit those buildings as a deterrent. We introduce insurance during construction and after construction as a measure of ensuring safeguards. But all the processes are there. But are the actors willing to do what is necessary? And those processes are not are not finite. There will be innovations from time to time. But we can put the process there, but you need to get the people to do the work. People should cut corners. People should play by the rules. People should act professionally. And so it is tempting to send, to point fingers at uh, anybody. But I think we all need to introspect, really and truly professionals or on all sides need to introspect. And we don't have to wait to be told or for government to chase us just to do the right thing. And for more stories, let's head over to our Abuja studios where Mark Wogun Yusuf is standing by. Hi, Mark Bre. Hello, Millicent. Our budget defense continued today at the National Assembly. And today, members of the National Assembly Joint Committees on Land and Marine Transport questioned the construction of a standard gauge for Kano Maradi rail line. While the plan, they say, is to build what they describe as archaic rail lines for the southeast and north central parts of the country. The committee members made their thoughts known to the Minister of Transport, Mr. Ruti Miyamechi, when he appeared before them to defend his ministry's 2022 budget proposal. Our correspondent Linda Kigbe reports. The construction of the 284-kilometer Kano Maradi Railway has been a major matter of discussion since the federal government announced plans for the project. During a budget defense session on Wednesday in the National Assembly, federal lawmakers interrogated the Minister of Transport on the rationale behind proposing a standard gauge rail line for the project, while a narrow gauge line is to be used for the southeast and not central rail lines. What's wrong with the southeast, north central? Are we not Nigerians? I'm from Portacot. Portacot is the equity. So they hate us. They hate you, me, you, all of us, all of us. I, I plead that we don't use sentiments to judge economic issues. So let me put the issues before you. The total cost for the construction of the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Eastern line, it's called Eastern line, which begins from Portacot all the way to Boronu, is about 14 billion between 12 and 14 billion dollars. When I laid the card to the, on the table before the president, I explained to the president, that if we start looking for the money, we'll go nowhere. So give me two approvals, so that every part of the country will have rail line. Give me two approvals. The first approval you should give me is, give me approval to, const to reconstruct, not to rehabilitate, to reconstruct the narrow gauge. Then give me a second approval that enables me to look for the 14 billion dollars to construct uh, standard gauge. So you have two approvals. Anyone I get money from, I'll go ahead. Uh, private sector contributions. In a different hearing room, members of the Senate Committee on Health are demanding answers from officials of the Health Ministry on the utilization of the Cancer Management Trust Fund. Several uh, 29 uh, million was released. That's like uh, almost, it was 800 million in 2020. Fully, that is almost 98% released. 2021, up to 66% of the fund has been released. As we speak in, on November the 4th, no single DTM patient has getting one single bubble. That is our concern. Let those that have uh, breast, cervical, and prostate cancer benefit. It will save life of some, of some people. The committee gives the Ministry of Health a December 5th, 2021 deadline to activate the fund for cancer patients. Linda Akibi, Channels Television News. Away from the National Assembly, lecturers at the University of Abuja are demanding the rescue of their kidnapped colleagues within the next 48 hours. The chairman of the Academic Staff Union of University, Uni Abuja Chapter, told journalists at a news conference in Abuja that the kidnappers have been demanding 50 million naira for each of the six persons abducted. They accused the security agencies of not deploying adequate surveillance equipment to track down the criminals. 
It's been over 48 hours since six people, including two professors, a senior lecturer, and three members of their families, were abducted from the University of Abuja staff quarters on Tuesday morning. And despite the huge deployment of security personnel on that day, none of the victims have been rescued. The situation is now a source of great concern for other lecturers in the school, as expressed by the University of Abuja chapter of the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, at this news conference. The lecturers are unhappy with the slow pace of rescue efforts and want their members back within the next 48 hours. We, we can't believe that right in FCT, the seat of power, these things are happening and no surveillance even by the either helicopter, police, to even trace where this individual is. It seems to us government is doing any is doing nothing to arrest the situation. But our what our union is saying, we want this our member back to us within 48 hours. A combined team of security personnel was deployed on Tuesday to go after the abductors and rescue the kidnapped victims. But 48 hours after, none has been rescued. What is most painful is their demand for payment of ransom from the helpless, helpless members of affected families and general public. The union believes that unless urgent measures are put in place, things may become worse and therefore demand that the following be done. One, immediate rescue and release of all our kidnap members, children and other staff. We tried to get to the families of the victims again, but the guards here deny passage for all non-residents, including journalists. The FCT Police Command also says rescue efforts are ongoing and will give an update at the proper time. Meanwhile, there's been an increase in the number of stop and search checkpoints on the Kefi Abuja Highway about 90 kilometers from the University of Abuja, resulting in this traffic gridlock. Insecurity in the nation's capital is on the rise, with kidnapping and armed robbery reported almost on a daily, a development that many residents want the security agencies to deal with squarely. When the news at 10 returns, MBA expresses dissatisfaction with the handling of the siege to the home of Justice Mary Audley by relevant agencies. Plus, COP26 participants in Glasgow, Scotland, focus on impact of increased use of coal as energy source on global climate change conditions. Do join us again. Welcome back to the News at 10. As part of measures to cut governance costs, the federal government has set up two subcommittees on the restructuring and rationalization of parastatals, agencies and commissions as recommended by the Oransaya-led presidential committee about 10 years ago. Inaugurating the committees, the secretary to the government of the federation, Mr. Boss Mustafa, represented by the head of service of the federation, Mrs. Folashade Yemieson, says the move by the government has become necessary, especially now. The committee is to, among other things, advise government on recommendations to be implemented and develop key performance indicators for assessment. The Oransani led committee had recommended that 263 of the statutory agencies be reduced to 161, 38 agencies be abolished, while 52 others be merged. And the Nigerian Bar Association says it's dissatisfied with the denials emanating from relevant agencies on the siege to the home of the Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice Mary Odili. The body is also alleging plots by agents of the federal government to intimidate the judiciary by instilling fear into the judges. These were the words of MBA President Mr. Olumide Akwata at the valedictory court session held in honor of Justice Samuel Oseji, who died on September the 28th, 10 months after he was elevated to the apex court. Family and friends of late Justice Samuel Oseji gather at the main courtroom of the Supreme Court for a valedictory session in his honor. They are joined by members of the bar and the bench. 
well accounted for. Extolling his attributes, the Chief Justice of Nigeria says Justice Useji would be sorely missed. He was the sign post of justice, equity and fair play. His judicial pronouncements have occupied vital pages of your books across the continent of Africa and Europe. Speaking on the siege on the home of Justice Mary Odili, President of the Nigerian Bar Association, says it has convened an emergency meeting where immediate steps to protect the judiciary from planned attacks were adopted. The legal body adds that it would leave no stone unturned to unmask those behind the attack, in spite of how highly placed they are. We are thoroughly dissatisfied with the denials emanating from the relevant government agencies and departments. And we have vowed to leave no stone unturned in our bid to unmask all those behind this attack and to bring to justice anyone found culpable, no matter how highly placed. Public officers must be made to account for whatever they do with their entrusted powers. And where there is any appearance of executive lawlessness, the NBA will respond with dispatch to demand for justice. It is with equal determination that we will also call out and discipline any of our members who is found to have been part of this despicable attempt to ridicule the judiciary. Whilst we note that the Inspector General of Police has announced the arrest of all the officers who invaded the residence of my Lord, the Honorable Justice Lord Lee, we however demand that the, this, that the veil of secrecy behind which those who directed the set, set officers are hiding must be torn to shreds. The late Justice Samuel Oseji died 10 months after his elevation to the Supreme Court bench. His death reduces the number of justices at the apex court to 17. That's all from the nation's capital. It's back to you, Millicent, for the rest of the news at 10. Man, thanks, Mark. Where? And we take you to health, where the need for the country to pay adequate attention to medical research is, as a way of growing its economy has been reiterated. The Minister of Works and Housing, Babatunde Fashola, made the call at the Nigerian Institute for Medical Research, Launch and Fundraising, where he serves as the Chairman, Board of Trustees. Donors and funders, including Governor Kaede Faimi of Ikiti State, say the initiative will increase the possibilities and capacities around medical research. Our correspondent Chris Hillems reports. This is an event that could change the course of medical research in a country and guests are gathered to be part of the launch of the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research Foundation. Thank you so much. According to the Director General of NIMA, the essence is to get the private sector and corporate individual play pivotal role in furthering the development of the country's pool of medical researchers. Having seen that the government cannot do it alone, with competing requests in the stream, we realize that there is a need to make deliberate effort and effectively bring on board the participation of the private sector to support government efforts to sustain continent research, training and development in our institution. Driving the course of the Naima Foundation is the Honorable Minister of Works and Housing, who is the Chairman of the Foundation's Board of Trustees. As far as he is concerned, supporting the Foundation is supporting the nation. Think of the employment being generated in all the facilities overseas where the vaccines were important are being manufactured. And think of how our own hard-earned resources is now keeping other people in employment and keeping businesses going. Think of what we can use that to do for ourselves. 10 billion naira fund is the initial job required to set the ball rolling for the foundation and the chairman of Nigeria Governors Forum amongst other donors, expresses the light over the initiative. That's why my colleagues have made it clear that we must support this cause and support it generously, uh, both at the level of our state, but also as a forum of governments uh, in the country. 
According to the UNESCO report towards 2030, China, Japan, US, Russia still accounts for 72% of medical researchers worldwide. This is what Naima Foundation appears set to change. Chris Lems, Channels Television News. And outside the shores of the country, the increase in the use of coal and natural gas is leaving a rise in carbon dioxide emissions despite a dip in 2020. This is according to a new report released at the ongoing UN Climate Summit in Glasgow. The new reports produced by the Global Carbon Project forecast emissions to rise by 4.9% this year. Our correspondent, Ayola Kasim, reports on today's session with a focus on energy. Energy accounts for a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions. The burning of coal, oil and gas over decades since the Industrial Revolution is mainly responsible for the carbon dioxide emissions causing climate change. Good morning and welcome to Energy Day here at COP26. The UK government says no other COP presidency has prioritised putting an end date on international fossil fuel finance. Today, we are publishing the Global Coal to Clean Power Transition Statement, a commitment to end coal investment, to scale up clean power, to make a just transition. But many are setting end dates to polluting fossil fuels, asking that all countries do not just cut emissions, but also provide affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all by 2030. If this year is the year we put an end to coal, this must also be the year that we prove to developing countries that clean energy is the most attractive and most affordable option by providing them a clean energy offer. And we must do this through technical assistance, collaboration, and making finance for clean energy dramatically easier to access. Questions of equity and climate justice will also be key as developing countries are unwilling to abandon fossil fuel powered economic growth without help from their wealthier counterparts to transition to cleaner alternatives. While we are preparing for the future, which is a green uh, 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 economy, so we must be able to take advantage of what we have today, so which is oil and gas. So for us to say, look, you be away with oil and gas and then uh, embrace the uh, green technology, that was, that was the committee's suicide. Signatories of the COP26 agreement commit to shun investment in new fossil fuel projects at home and abroad. The commitments are not binding and some of the signatories have said they will need sufficient help in order to face out fossil fuels. From the venue of COP26, Ayona Kassim, Channels Television News. Now time for some business news. Here's Anne Wilder. Thank you, Millicent. Hello and welcome to Business News. Deposit money banks in Nigeria say old 20 and 50 pounds notes will no longer be accepted by the end of this year. And this comes as the Bank of England has announced that it will withdraw the currency notes after September the 30th, 2022. To this effect, Fidelity Bank and other deposit money banks in Nigeria have set December the 31st as deadline for accepting the current 20 and 50 pounds notes for proper conclusion of cash evacuation. Banks are also calling on customers to use or deposit their paper pound notes into their domiciliary accounts by December the 31st this year to avoid a loss in the value of their money. And now some company news, MTN Nigeria Communications PLC has successfully completed the issuance of its 89.9 billion Naira Series 2 10-year fixed rate bonds due in 2031. The Series 2 bond is under the $200 billion billion Naira issuance program, and it is the second issuance in the year 2021 by the telecom company. It was launched at the clearing coupon of 12.75% in qualified bids. In October 2021, the Securities and Exchange Commission granted MTN Nigeria Communications PLC approval to launch its Series 2 10-year 12.75% fixed-rate bond due 2031. 
Almost one month after the approval, the company, at a formal final signing ceremony, executes legal agreement and documentation in relation to the bond under the 200 billion naira bond issuance program. This is approximately a 90 billion naira 10-year bond um, with a 12.75 coupon rate, and this represents the second and final tranche of the registered program of 200 billion. Um, the 200 billion issued um, across both tranches represents the largest bond issues from any corporate issuer in 2021, reflecting the strong investor appetite and confidence in our company. The book build process commenced on October the 8th, 2021, and was completed on October the 15th, 2021. According to the CEO, the bond issuance aligns with the company's strategy to diversify its funding sources as their investment plans for the proceeds gotten from the Series 2 bond. It's in line with our commitment, 600 billion over three years, focus on quality, expansion of 4G coverage, and improvement of the capacity that we have so customers can have a seamless experience, focus on rural connectivity, potentially participation in 5G and continuing our social investment program as I indicated. This bond provides um, MTN with an opportunity to borrow publicly uh, to price probably a, a bit more competitively than they would um, from the banks and you know as he as he's joked um, you know try and match the market and see where they can um, actually issue bonds uh, uh, more competitively and cheaper for them. The ratings of the telecommunications company was recently upgraded to AAA by the Global Credit Ratings, a reflection of the organization's strength and stability. MTN Nigeria is one of Africa's largest providers of communication services, connecting approximately 68 million people in communities across the country with the world. Well, the color is red today as the domestic equities market moved further into negative territory at the close of business. Laddie Williams has the details. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. Well, it's the penultimate trading day and the bear managed to regain dominance in the market after a three-day tussle. The growling of the bear shed off eight basis points from the All Share Index, and about 16 billion naira chucked out of the market value. Uh, let's uh, zoom in on the activity chart where the uh, volume dropped further from 292 million units traded yesterday to 160.87 uh, million units in today's session, while value fell by 31.6% to 1.4 uh, billion naira. Sectoral indexes also got smacked by the uh, grizzly bear as all key indexes took a swipe except for the insurance index, which gained 1.29%, uh, which led the insurance uh, stocks to actually dominate the uh, gainers charts. We have our FBN Holdings again today leading the top uh, trades uh, counter, contributing about 19.52 million units to the total volume of uh, transactions. Well, it's the last trading day of the week tomorrow. Let's see if the bull can make an appearance. And that's the Stock Market Report. I'm Laddie Williams. It's back to you. And that's business news. Thanks for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. Back to you, Melissa. Thank you, Anne. The U.S. envoy to the Horn of Africa, Jeffrey Feltman, is visiting the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa, to press for a peaceful solution to the crisis north of the country. Ethiopia is currently under a six-month nationwide state of emergency as the Tigray People's Liberation Front and troops allied against the Ethiopian central government rapidly advance on Addis Ababa, raising concerns the capital could fall. Simon Pusey has more in Around the World in Five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. The UK has become the first country in the world to approve a pill to treat COVID-19. The tablet, called Monopirava, will be given twice a day to vulnerable patients recently diagnosed with the disease. It's being touted as a game-changing discovery. The drug, which has been closely tested, has been proven to reduce the chance of dying or being hospitalised by half in those most at risk of developing severe COVID symptoms. Health Secretary Savid Javid said the treatment was a game-changer for the most frail and immunosuppressed. More than 40 countries have agreed to end the financing of fossil fuel projects abroad during the fourth day of the COP26 in Glasgow, among them the UK, Poland and Vietnam. 
The deal is based on the shared idea that in order to reach the zero emissions target by 2050, countries need to boost renewable energy sources worldwide. However, many of the world's biggest coal-dependent countries, such as Australia, India, China and the US, haven't signed up to the pledge. Meanwhile, protesters have found a rather creative way to make their voices heard at COP26. No no Around half a dozen people dressed as Pikachus, which is a type of Pokemon, of course, to demonstrate against Japan's continued use of coal-fired power stations. They're calling for the government in Japan to phase out coal by 2030 at the latest. A 36-year-old Australian man called Terence Darrell Kelly has been charged with the abduction of the four-year-old girl, Cleo Smith, who was found safe and well on Wednesday. What's your name? What's your name, sweetheart? Um, my name is Cleo. Your name is Cleo. Hello, Cleo. Yes. The moment she was rescued has been released, as has footage of her being taken out of the house by police. She disappeared from her family's tent at a campsite on the 16th of October, triggering a massive search. 18 days later, she was found in a house in Carnarvon. The man has been charged with forcibly or fraudulently taking or enticing a child under 16. More than 800 migrants have been rescued from several boats in the Mediterranean. More than 400 of them were saved from a dangerously overcrowded boat that was close to sinking on Wednesday night. The rescue boat CI4 arrived shortly after and provided the migrants with life jackets. The German ship said it was now heading to the southern island of Lampedusa and was waiting to be assigned a port of safety. The UK's Brexit minister has met France's Europe minister in Paris in an attempt to resolve a dispute over post-Brexit fishing rights. Lord Frost has travelled with the hope of easing tensions between the countries. France threatened a series of measures against the UK unless more fishing licences were granted to French boats by the 2nd of November. The US envoy to the Horn of Africa is visiting the Ethiopian capital Addis Ababa to press for a peaceful solution to the war in the north of the country. It comes as video released by Tigray TV showed forces from the group marching in two towns it said it captured over the weekend. The broadcaster is not recognized by the central government, which disputes the claims. Tigrayan fighters have made some advances towards the capital in recent fighting. One of Facebook's earliest investors has labelled the social media giant's plans for a metaverse as dystopian. Roger McNamee founded a venture capital firm which invested $210 million in Facebook shares in 2009 and 2010. Our company is now Meta. Mark Zuckerberg announced that Facebook was rebranding to Meta last month. McNamee said he was not convinced the metaverse would be safe without regulation. And finally, the South African author Damon Galgut has won the prestigious Booker Prize for fiction at the third attempt for his novel, The Promise. Is The Promise by Damon Galgut. Galgut, who was previously nominated in 2003 and 2010, picked up a £50,000 prize. The Promise is his ninth book and follows the decline of one South African family over four decades from the apartheid era to the present day. The author said he was really profoundly, humbly grateful for the award. This has been a great year for African writing, and I'd like to accept this on behalf of all the stories told and untold, the writers heard and unheard from the remarkable continent that I'm part of. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Thank you, Simon. World football governing body FIFA has appointed referees from North Africa to officiate the Super Eagles' last two games of the group phase of FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022 African Qualifying Series. Tunisian referee will officiate the match. Day five encounter between the Super Eagles and the lone stars of Liberia in Tangiers, Morocco on November the 13th. For the day six clash against Cape Verde, um, at the Teslim Balloon Stadium on November the 16th, FIFA has listed Algerian official Mustafa Gorbal as the referee. And Falconet's coach Christopher Danjuma has invited 31 players to the camp for the FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup third round fixture against Congo with the first leg taking place in Brazzaville on December the 5th. Nigeria will host the return leg at the Mobalaji Johnson Arena in Lagos on December the 16th. On the list, nine defenders, ten midfielders and eight forwards as well as four goalkeepers. 
And that's Sports News is back to Millicent with the rest of the news at 10. Thank you, Victor. And the main news again. Candidates for the Anambra governorship election today signed a peace pact in Orca ahead of Saturday's exercise. As National Peace Committee asked voters not to be afraid to exercise their franchise. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Melissa Walker. Have a good night and stay safe.